It's my pleasure now to be speaking to John Madden, the Oscar-nominated director for Shakespeare in Love, whose latest film, Operation Mincemeat, is now releasing in cinemas across Australia. John, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, this is such an intriguing film based, based on a true story. What was it that attracted you to directing this film? Uh, it just, well, the, the, you sort of actually summed it up. It's an extraordinary story and, and, a, and perhaps a unique one in the kind of vast span of World War II cinematic literature. It sort of stands out uh, as an oddball, really. Uh, if you consider most war films of that era, they, they are, as we articulate in the film, usually about bombs and bullets and uh, and uh, you know frontline conflicts of uh, extraordinary jeopardy and and um, and heroics uh, you know involving winners and losers um, and and that shape of the narrative, of course, not surprisingly, it, it is very very powerful and and um, you know from from the war onwards tended to generate an enormous amount of that kind of film. But uh, this one is so unusual uh, because of what we uh, call in the film the hidden war, I suppose. It's about an extraordinary strategy that was designed to bring about a particular set of circumstances and to defy the laws of probability to an extraordinary degree. Um, I mean, you probably explained to people or would in your story exactly what the disinformation they're trying to create um, which is really in, in the aid of, of protecting an incredibly vulnerable invasion force from possible massacre if, uh, if they don't succeed in convincing the enemy that something else is going to happen. So it's an extraordinary idea. Uh, more particularly for me, it, it, it has the appeal of um, something that I'm always drawn to, which is a, a film of a very mixed, shifting tone. Uh, I mean, it is at once a thriller, it's a war story, it's an emotional story, um, it's about uh, storytelling itself and the creation of a fiction. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's also strangely comedic in places, almost absurdist because of the nature of what the uh, um, deception involves, um, you know, most particularly the presence of a dead body. Mm. Uh, and um, all of those things, uh, I, I like films that actually swerve around corners that you're not expecting to go around. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a narrative that you can't really predict how it's going to unfold. Uh, and, and I think that challenge, both to Michelle Ashford, with whom I was working at the time when this project came up, and I both responded to very strongly uh, because I think it may, it's just an incredibly compelling and engaging uh, prospect, um, you know, assume, assuming we, we got it right or, or, or um, uh, you know, the, but I, I think it's a strong film in terms of that, that, that magic ingredient that all good films just have, which is a surprise, I think. Yes, absolutely. No, I think it's a really well constructed uh, narrative. And I was wondering, you've mentioned, Michelle, how closely you worked with her in fashioning the screenplay and, and, and I suppose, tweaking it in, in so far as all the different elements in the story. Yeah, the answer is we work very closely together, though geographically miles apart. <laughs> um, I mean, not in not not throughout. Actually, we were together. Um, Michelle came over here um, a couple of times. I went there to. She works in um, Santa Monica, but obviously in the latter part, uh, we finished filming. Um, uh, in four days before the lockdown in Spain, the last 10 days of the filming were in Spain, which is where, as, as you know, where some of the story takes place. Mm. And from then on, I couldn't, you know, I wasn't in contact with anybody. I mean, physical contact, my composer, my editor, my writer, we were all in this new world that we exist in now where I'm talking to you. Um, so no, the but the the uh, answer to your question is that Michelle and I first started talking about this about eight years ago, 
uh, she was heavily involved in a um, thing that I, which is where I uh, met her, which is on a television series, limited television series about the sex researchers, Masters and Johnson. And that ran for four seasons. And she was taking time out of the intervals between each season of that to kind of ponder the material. And I first read uh, what we called the typo draft, um, you know, first draft of the story, uh, which she threw in everything, uh, thrown everything against the wall just to say, okay, well, how's this for a shape kind of thing. That was in 2016. And since then, uh, between 2016, 2019, when we started to shoot in December, 2019, um, we worked very closely on uh a succession of drafts and it was like it's like, to me it's like an object lesson actually in the importance of development script development because this is a complex story as i've alluded to taking place on many different levels with different moods and different tones and actually um navigating that and braiding the different strands of the story together in ways that give the audience the necessary information they have without the film becoming bogged down in that and keeping the story propulsively moving forward because it's a story that has a ticking clock um, and, and moving towards a target that they imagine they're in control of, the characters who are creating them, creating it, that's to say a deception that they've take meticulous trouble to build. Um, but of course, find this, the target is moved by the time uh, you know it unfolds or moves beyond their own control, and suddenly the film takes a, a very different turn there. Where, for all the efforts at control that they put into it, uh, this fiction they lose control of that fiction um, in really interesting ways. So. Uh, uh, that meant a, a tremendous degree of push and pull and Michelle and I listening to what the script was telling us and trying to learn exactly how to do what we were doing. Okay. I was also wondering when I was watching the film, because I, I have memories of the film The Man Who Never Was from 1950. The Man Who Never Was. Yeah, yeah Ronald Neem's yep. film. And I was wondering if some of that was perhaps also uh, a basis perhaps for the, uh, the this new version of that story. No, we didn't approach it at all as a uh, rewrite. Uh, rewrite remake I should say <laughs> rewrite we certainly did in places but <laughs> but um, <clears throat> no uh, the, and the reason for that is is um, simple actually which is that although actually I think that's a very effective film I avoided uh, watching it myself until quite late in the day simply because I didn't want to be in a sort of defensive posture of saying well I didn't really want to do that because that's too close to this film I mean, they're almost, it, it, it's quite difficult to find people now who have seen that film. Mm. But the reason is because the first, uh, The Man Who Never Was, the film was an ad adaptation of Ewan Montague's own account of the event, yeah. of the, you know, the creation of the plan. Uh, something he sued, uh, that's to say, campaigned with the intelligence, um, uh, British intelligence, to allow him to write. I think he wasn't backward about putting himself at the center of things. And, uh, and the intelligence services were very, 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 uh, were policing that very carefully and it was heavily vetted. And in one particular degree, um, absolutely refused to uh, allow any sense of whose body was actually used. That's the most significant difference. Um, uh, between the two, that version of the story and our version of the story. Although what actually happened was that, uh, you know, it remained classified, uh, everything to do with Operation Mincemeat until 1996, when um, MI5 files were declassified and Ben McIntyre, whose book provides the basis for our film, Ben was, you know, both an advisor and very much involved, not as a writer, but uh, in the, uh, as the film developed, you know, had an absolutely gigantic kind of room high stack of materials, records and files that related to the whole thing and you know, the minutest detail, which of course was not available to anybody else until that moment. And so we had a totally different template really. And, and therefore the freedom to examine the, 
the story from you know in a slightly different way than that one did mm. um so yes the bare bones of the story are similar mm. uh, but crucially a great part of that film and that account is taken up with an entirely fictional uh, sequence relating to you know how they identified the body they were going to use and uh, involved a lengthy scene in a hospital where the father of the um, you know, uh, the, the, the poor man who was in a sort of vegetative state, but not dead at that point, mm. was going to be, you know, part of an extraordinary, uh, you know, um, uh, idea and so on and so forth and secured the, the um, uh, uh, approval and, and agreement of the man's father, which is entirely noble and admirable, but of course had nothing to do with the truth. They simply stole a body. And got on with it, and um, <clears throat> which was not an idea that was deemed palatable or desirable to put in front of the public at the time. So, no, there was a very different set of circumstances, and uh, you know, whilst the admiration for what they did in terms of creating the story remains absolutely as high in our version as it does in the original version, you know, nevertheless, it was flying an enormous kite uh, in both, you know, in in life generally. It was such an improbable idea and had so many ways, frankly, that it could have gone wrong, many of which it did. But actually, uh, the idea, the fundamental idea held. Absolutely. And, and that's what makes it so intriguing and, and uh, su such a great uh, story. Um, yeah. You've worked with so many good actors uh, over the number of years that you've made so many really distinctive films and i can imagine it must have been quite a joy to work with colin firth and matthew mcfadgen uh and um kelly mcdonald for example yeah. uh in in the key roles that they have that uh, it, it must have been quite a delight to work with them <laughs> well it was it was you know colin and i have known each other very well and actually happen to be neighbors as well since um 1990 eight when we uh when we made shakespeare in love and actually even before that we had been trying to find um uh, something to work on together because something we did uh, join hands on uh you know just fell apart for one reason or another having to do with rights uh, so that was a you know an elusive target since then in terms of you know him and i uh, uh coming together on something so this seemed like such a natural piece of casting for Colin. Um, Matthew would always have been my first choice for this role, but he wasn't available to us when we first were looking at it because of what was mooted to be the third um, uh, season of Succession, which cut right across our filming dates. But, but handily, uh, the writing got a little behind on that and they needed more time and the dates for that move back by two months and I sort of literally pounced on that situation, sent the script to Matthew immediately and he got back very, very quickly and we met and that was sealed. Kelly had had really always been in my mind as a kind of perfect piece of casting for Jean. And likewise, uh, Penelope Wilton, who I've worked with uh, several times uh, and is a genius anyway, uh, for the other crucial role of Hester. So. You know, the two women and the two men, uh, that that quartet came together quite, uh, well, satisfyingly would be the understatement, but I mean, just a perfect, a perfect quartet for me, and they are the center of the film. But, you know, it's a credit to the material, both in, in its execution by Michelle Ashford and the original story, and the weird sort of richness of the characters that were involved who might themselves have been characters in a fiction. I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 the coroner, for example, with the, the unimprovable name of Bentley Purchase, I mean, could literally have stepped out of a Dickens novel. Um, so there were very rich characters all the way through the story, uh, you know, with Winston Churchill sitting at the top of them, of course. And, um, and that, that we have an amazing repertoire of actors who, who, this kind of story, I suppose, is kind of second nature because we've grown up with it so much. And um, and so the casting was not onerous. Uh, you know, it was a matter of once people identified somebody that I thought would be the right choice, we generally speaking 
were able to cast that person, assuming they they were available. And and um, yes, it's a it's it's a fantastic cast. It's a very very rich cast. Absolutely, I'm glad you mentioned Churchill, Simon Russell Beale, uh, who is yeah. so good, good in the role. Oh God! <laughs> well, he's just an amazing actor. You know, he's a sort of towering figure, really, and. Uh, when I actually, I thought I know who would be a magnificent Churchill. I didn't realise uh, that actually he, along with, of course, countless others in the British uh, theatrical annals, had actually played Churchill, but in a quite obscure, dramatised documentary that the BBC made some years back, uh, with only little sort of cameo moments. But um, he accepted the role before he'd even read the script, actually, Simon, and then uh, accepted it more emphatically once he had read the script, because it's he only, he only has two scenes, as you know, but very, very critical ones. Exactly. And it was also intriguing for me to see Johnny Flynn playing Ian Fleming. And, yeah. uh, and there's a, a James Bond reference. Uh, uh, I thought, how, uh, how accurate a character would he have been at that time? Okay, we seem to have a frozen screen. Ah. Hello. Ah. <laughs> you, you Sorry, you dropped out there for a moment. Yes, yes, we're talking about Ian Fleming. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. So, um, and indeed, uh, in this weird document, which had all kinds of ideas about how to uh, deceive the Germans and and so forth, and to disguise ways of possibly disguising Allied intentions, number twenty eight was uh, the idea that became Operation Mincemeat, which, uh, based on the Haversack ruse, I won't bother to go into an explanation of that. The film explains it, um, uh, and. Um, and so pr pretty much exactly as we have him in the film, you know, he's moving around in a world where uh, Admiral John Godfrey quite clearly became the model for the character M and was known at that time to um, Fleming as M. Uh, similarly, the kind of there was a department that dealt with obscure gadgets and ideas that were employed by agents, double agents, triple and otherwise. Uh, you know, court screws that work backwards and cameras and blah, blah, blah. Uh, that, that branch, it was a man called um, Charles Fraser Smith, and he operated out of a, a sort of strange zone that was known as Q branch, and that, that character clearly was the model for Q. So here we have in the middle of our story, the man who created the most, um, you know, well-known uh, uh, sort of... Um, panoply of espionage that we now have in cinematic fiction anyway espionage fiction uh, but he was 10 years away from writing casino royale at that point and so um we actually use that in a particular way um as, as something that you know is obviously our speculation and invention that he's he's as it were writing the account of what what we're seeing the, the lost the lost dean fleming novel but um, uh, but actually, there's a seriousness to that, really, in terms of uh, because the film really is about storytelling. Uh, you know, it is itself an act of storytelling. Cinematically speaking, uh, we're creating our own fiction about uh, a, an idea that was a fiction trying to pass as a truth. And even that truth was not entirely verifiable. I mean, it's a sort of receding hall of mirrors and... Um, uh, yeah, it was just very intriguing, intriguing sort of uh, uh, layered narrative in that way. Exactly, exactly. And that, again, that works uh, so well uh, in the overall narrative. And I always enjoy listening to Thomas Newman's uh, music. And uh, again, it's used so yeah. well in uh, Operation Mincemeat. Well, he's a very, you know, he's a long-term collaborator of mine. He's done the last... Uh, you know, four or five films that I've done, and um, uh, and this one, and you know, we have the advantage, obviously, of knowing each other very well, which came in particularly useful in this case because as I referred to earlier. We 
we created and composed uh, this score. I mean, I, I was not involved in the composition, except obviously shaping the spotting of the film and the and how the music would work. And we had an, an extensively researched temp score, which involves some of his own music, actually. But we did that all at um, Across an Ocean. We, we Tom and I just met each other for the first time on this project one week ago when we um, had a theatrical opening of the film in the US as Netflix was about to launch it on their platform. And that's the first time we've been in one another's presence since the whole thing began. Uh, you know, Tom has a very particular style that, uh, and a musical instinct um, that I just treasure, which is that he his music somehow exists. It's incredibly musical, but it also edges over into sound and atmosphere and and is wraps itself around the narrative in such an extraordinary way rather than coexisting um, with the narrative in a sort of separate way so that it, it, it sort of interposes itself between you and the story you're watching. You, with him, you can't really tell where the, the story stops and the music begins, uh, but it's very, very, very crucial in this film, particularly in terms of navigating a story that is constantly turning left when you expect it to be going straight forward um, and, um, and, and sort of, uh, you know, allowing the story to surf on, a, on different shifting tones uh, of, of, you know, rhythm, excitement, emotion, all kinds of things that are going on. It's a magnificent score, I think. Exactly. Well, look, it, it's a, an excellent film, and certainly I urge um, all of my uh, listeners and viewers to uh, go and see the film. It's great that it's now releasing across Australia, uh, and I gather we're maybe yep. one of the last countries to have the film? I, I'm not sure about that. I think it, it, the rollout of the film in the UK and Europe some of the key European territories is sort of unfolding now. It opened about uh, uh, four weeks ago in the UK. So it's already opened in France and Belgium. I think not yet in Spain and Italy. I'm not sure about that. It actually, we ended up postponing the European and the UK opening because of the Omicron variant. It was originally supposed to open in January. Uh, but it was all postponed because of that and because of, I think, the sort of feared reluctance of audience, particularly, uh, you know, the demographic that this film, you know, was particularly important to this film. Those people who, who have a, a long enough memory like myself to remember their parents' involvement in that war, let's put it that way. Um, and so Japan, I think, was ahead of everybody else because we couldn't, those dates couldn't be moved. But uh, no, I think it's it's still unfolding, and um, you, I don't think you're the last, but I think you're another way. And, and Netflix, who acquired the film for the US, Canada, and actually they bought out South America, which we had pre-sold, so they have the Americas, essentially. Uh, they released the film onto their platform, which is only available in those countries, uh, yesterday. So, um, no, you're right up there with the front runners there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's great news. Well, John, congratulations yeah. on the film. And I, I must ask you, are you working on another film at the moment? Well, I'm about to. Um, I don't, I, I, I'm uh, not being coy and not sort of saying exactly what that is at the moment because it's a rather sensitive stage where we, we, you know, we're about to focus on the casting of it. But I will say that it's with an Australian writer who is absolutely fantastic writer called Samantha Strauss, who's Sydney based. Um, and she and I've been working on this film actually for about uh, three years, but it went into a sort of slightly, um, uh, not into abeyance, but went into kind of cold storage, if we to use a, 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 an image from Mincemeat, um, because I was making Mincemeat and, and uh, so it, 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 we sort of held it for a while, but I think we're about to get going with that. It's a US set story, but uh, it's any more than that for the moment. Well, good luck with that. And uh, and congratulations on all the films that you've made and uh, uh, and your Oscar nomination uh, for Shakespeare in Love, which you must have been quite excited by. 
uh, yes, surprised and excited. <laughs> I mean, we, none of us had any idea of the reach that film would eventually have. It just seemed like the kind of film that might be enjoyed by people like me who, you know, grown up with Shakespeare and so forth. But of course it was an absolutely spectacularly wonderful script and, and idea. And, and again, we had an amazing cast in the end. And, and uh, yeah, it was, that was quite a ride for sure. It's one of those films that I think actually holds its own. Uh, it doesn't seem to, I saw it recently. I haven't seen it for a long time. And, and I don't think it, it, it doesn't date in a curious way because of course it's so wildly anachronistic itself mm -hmm. that it just sort of seems to exist in its own time zone. It certainly does. And, uh, and, and of course you had such a great cast with the second best uh, exotic Marigold Hotel, which uh, uh, was must yes. have been also yes. fun to make. <laughs> that, that was that was an amazing experience to make. Yes, we obviously made what I consider to be two halves of the same story. It was, it was sort of a, a film and its companion piece. Not that we knew that when we were making the first one. It was the first time there's ever been what they'd call a cinematic sequel. <laughs> with a cast in there, largely in their 60s and 70s. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, no, that was, uh, that was fantastic, uh, fantastic pair of films to me. Okay, excellent stuff. We've been speaking to John Madden, the director of Operation Mincemeat, now on release in Australian cinemas. Go and see it. John, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you, Peter, no pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.